Thank you again for the invitation to speak here. It's my pleasure. So I win, no need to, to give the talk, or is this a war? Or I think, uh, I hope you, I can still convince you that next-gen sequencing is, is uh, very impactful for metastatic colorectal cancer patients. Uh, I'm making my life very difficult. I'm not talking about next-gen sequencing for KRAS, NRAS, BRAF testing. Um, uh, we, there are some people even that talk that next-gen sequencing term, this term should not be used anymore. We do sequencing that is next-gen in most of the cases, okay? Uh, so I'm going to focus on uh, the emerging markers and uh, the other markers that you see in this list. I'm not talking about the validated markers, KRAS and RAS, BRAF, HER2, MSI. I mean, you can definitely look uh, at these genes on a targeted next-gen panel, but you can also do single gene testing to identify these alterations. So I'm not talking about this. Today, I'm making my life difficult. I'm going to talk about large, comprehensive, broad next-gen sequencing panels and uh, how useful they are to uh, work as either negative predictive predictive markers for anti-GFR therapy, dynamic changes with liquid biopsies, and finding these rare alterations that may have a very high impact in the outcome of uh, selected patients, okay? So the first example I want to highlight is this case control study from Italy um, looking at resistant versus responsive patients to anti-GFR. This is the first time you give anti-GFR to a patient. Case control again, and you see how uh, enriched rare alterations, ALK, ROS1, track fusions, MET amplifications, HER2 amplifications, PI3K exon 20 mutations, these are in the resistant population. You see the survival curves, how dramatic they are. And uh, again, there is just one single patient there that was responsive and had a PI3K mutations. Remember, these are all KRAS, NRAS, BRAF, wild type patients. So the value of next-gen sequencing here for super or hyper selection of the responders to anti-GFR therapy. Okay. There are other examples also highlighted by Dr. Fort, uh, Fortunato. Uh, here, this is a phase two trial looking at dynamic changes over time in liquid biopsies after exposure to anti-GFR therapy with this new, and new agents in development. In this case here is a SIM004. In the triple negative population, RAS, BRAF, EGFR negative uh, had the highest benefit with a re-challenge with anti-GFR therapy as compared to uh, investigator choice in this case in the third, fourth line setting was uh, mainly capecitabine. Okay. But what we are interested in is finding these rare alterations. You have a list here of the fusion events that were reported in colorectal cancer. I want to highlight the prevalence. Altogether, less than 2% of the cases, but they are there, and we have targetability evidence uh, that is uh, very clear in two cases with case reports. And uh, we can also translate the evidence from other tumors to colorectal cancer. Most important is the enrichment uh, for uh, the positive cases. No? Right side of the colon, RAS, BRAF, wild types, resistance to anti-GFR, and mainly MSI patients. These are the ones that have the highest chance of being fusion positive. And in some cases, even close to 10% of the cases, right? So it's also not mutually exclusive. You can definitely find a patient that is BRAF or RAF or KRAS mutant and also uh, have the fusion event. So it's not black and white. The example here being FGFR fusion. So again, highlighting that the evidence that we have for targetability is uh, low. It's at the case report level or small cohorts, but it is uh, dramatic and evident. Um, what else can we find with next-gen sequencing? ATM mutations, other DNA damage repair alterations, HER2 mutations that sometimes coexist with HER2 amplifications, these rare uh, mutations in BRAF, this is codon 594, uh, and MET amplifications, uh, in this case mainly those that are refractory to anti-GFR therapy. The targetability evidence here is preclinical, but we have plenty of early trials looking at targeted alterations. Uh, and targeted therapies against these uh, rare alterations. So this is a very promising area, but 
remember, we are talking about relatively few uh, uh, patients. No? Less in total, probably less than 10% of the cases would have these alterations that are targetable based on uh, uh, early evidence. And there is another situation, still very rare, but also uh, interesting for uh, immunotherapy. MSS cases that have hyper hyper mutation, uh, um, in this case poly E, probably less than 1% of the cases, but uh, only with next gen sequencing, the complexity of identifying this with a uh, single gene panel. So here it's uh, again uh, another emerging marker for selected patients. So another way to look at this is. Imagine I do next-gen sequencing to a large cohort in a molecular prescreening program, and I see what the percentage of patients that ended up receiving a match therapy in a clinical trial and had a benefit. So we were the first to publish our experience uh, from 2010 to 2015, more than 600 patients, and 15% of those were included in a match trial. These were old days. We were still believers of uh, MEC targeting for KRAS and PI3K targeting for PI3K mutations. Not anymore. We know the relatively lack of efficacy in this setting, moving more onto the BRAF and all these other emerging markers at this stage. Uh, just to highlight, it's not only having uh, the alteration, it's having the right drugs for the patients that matter as well. Uh, MD Anderson has also published their experience doing broad next-gen sequencing in close to 500 cases. They complemented with targeted immunohistochemistry, SIMP uh, analysis, and 16% of the cases they were able to match to a clinical trial. Okay, the benefit is unknown at this, uh, in, in this publication, but uh, we know uh, from the matches that it's probably less than one-third of the cases. But uh, as uh, Dr. Sabine Teshpar was just highlighting, very nice uh, example of uh, next-gen targeting more than 400 genes, looking at mutations, copy number alterations, and fusion events in more than 1,000 cases. This is the memoidus low catering experience. And they have here in this graph uh, that you can see the prevalence of actionable alterations according to so I cannot find my pointer, or maybe, uh, here we go. Uh, on the, um, uh, in one side, you can see the level of actionability here, okay? Green would be an FDA-approved drug. So you see, for example, in MSI cases, 100%, in this case, PD-1 therapy in the US. In blue, you have uh, FDA-approved drugs for another indication. In dark, uh, pink here, violet, you have uh, compelling clinical evidence from other trials, okay? Uh, look at the prevalence in uh, different subsets of colorectal cancer. MSI high, secondary alterations, up to 50% of the cases would have a very good match and 10% uh, with fusion events. MSS, right side of the colon, this goes to close to 20% of the cases, but still some mutations here and fusions that are uh, of interest for a targeted therapy. And MSS left side of the colon, the lowest rate, okay? So it all, it's all a matter of, uh, okay, next slide. Uh, probably, can you move to the next slide, please? I cannot. Uh, Advance. Okay. okay, so it's all a matter of how strict you are with your criteria for targetability. You know? So ASMO is working in a scale of actionability, and it will next-gen sequencing at the end of the day will depend on uh, availability of uh, off-table use of therapies uh, and or or even more important access to clinical trials. So you have a list of this uh, in preparation actionability scale that goes from uh, survival benefit in clinical trials where access is uh, considered a standard of care, alterations that are associated with responses but we don't know is still the benefit in terms of survival in these cases, uh, treatment 
with a match therapy is preferable in the context of a prospective registry or a prospective clinical trial. Other situations where the evidence comes from a different tumor type or the functionality is unknown, in this case, clinical trials should be discussed with the patient until you have preclinical evidence of targetability. So we are at the, really, when doing next-gen sequencing, broad next-gen sequencing, we are uh, highly dependent on having access to clinical trials, okay? So in conclusion, my next slide, please. I cannot move them. Here okay. we go. Yes, for next-gen sequencing in colorectal cancer, but uh, if you are outside a reference institution where there is also, in terms of cost-effectiveness, uh, access to next-gen sequencing, please use clinical molecular enrichment criteria, and this can be, for example, unusual clinical behavior, colitis-associated colorectal cancer, MSI cases, I think that they deserve uh, a second look for alternative uh, on uh, extra alterations, the BRAF, RAS, wild-type right-sided tumors that are resistant to anti-HFR therapy. Uh, these are the ones that you have the highest chance, if close to 20% of the case, you will find something interesting for a targeted therapy in clinical trials. Uh, and I want to finish, next slide. Thanking uh, the gastrointestinal tumors group from Paul Debron, uh, molecular prescreening program that gives us uh, uh, access to uh, next gen in more than uh, 400 patients every year at Paul Debron, and we are uh, learning uh, on a daily basis. And my my data science group at at Paul Debron, together with all the collaborators. Thank you very much.